this session together and thank everyone for their attendance. Councilman Dyer is uh, going to be about 30 minutes late and Rosemary Wilson is in the same position running a little bit late. Council would be uh, my recommendation at the formal session just prior to the invocation that we'll have a moment of silence in Myra's memory. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm very sorry that we, last Tuesday I told you about her being placed on hospice. I had no idea that, you know, we would have been burying her yesterday. But anyway, that is the game plan if no one objects for recognition of her uh, in the formal session. Uh, the first thing we'll do is get started with the city manager's briefing. The first one's going to be on the vibe district, Mr. Spore. Uh, thank you very much, Mayor and members of council. The presentation today is going to be uh, kicked off by Emily Lebose, who's our director of cultural affairs. And she has uh, some of her colleagues here with her that have been working on the uh, concept of establishing a creative uh, arts and industries district uh, along Virginia Beach Boulevard. So we wanted to give you an update today. Good afternoon, members, council, mayor. Thank Emily, you for having glad me. To have you here. Thank you. Um, I, I'm here today with um, Andrew Fine and Laura Hubber. Christina Chastain might be um, joining us. Have you all with us as well? Here, they um, they are citizens that have really started this grassroots effort um, down at the resort um, to create the city's first arts and cultural district. So we're here today to give you background on where we have been and where we're going, give you some vision and goals and objectives of the district and uh, a path forward. So legislation was added to um, the General Assembly in 2009, permitted cities to establish arts and cultural districts. <laughs> and there really has been a boom um, in the past few years. Over 500 arts and cultural districts have been named and established throughout the US um, and more are growing. Uh, so the local leaders in the resort uh, really started this grassroots effort, came together with existing businesses that are um, there to look into the creation of the Vibe District. You as city council named it a top priority at your retreat um, in February and RAC uh, unanimously approved the concept of the Vibe District at their last meeting. We looked at uh, other districts in, throughout the country. Uh, a lot of people love what's happening in the Wynwood Walls down in Miami with the murals, and um, as well as um, Paducah, Kentucky, Santa Fe, Austin. You look at these cities and you know that they have a very vibrant um, cultural arts scene, and it, they use it as a, an economic development tool as well as cultural tourism. <clears throat> Bradenton, Florida, some more examples. Um, Minneapolis is doing um, great work um, with their arts district. Um, and then when you look locally, um, Norfolk, Richmond um, have all established arts and cultural districts um, very, re very recently. The vision of the Vibe District really started with a group of artists, restaurants, and businesses in around the 18th Street area. They organized a First Friday event. In the first anniversary is in April. And um, they're fo focusing on artists and related retail. And they're looking at you know, ways to attract both residents and visitors. And they see it as a compliment. You know, we've discussed um, having Town Center as an arts and cultural district really could complement um, Town Center, where Town Center could be more of the um, performing arts um, aspect of, of arts and cultural district, where Vibe really could be artists working and um, selling their goods. So I will invite Laura up here. Oh, the, the um, map of the district. Um, this is all very proposed, but it and, um, includes the uh, top triangle is Mocha, Virginia Mocha, and it continues down through um, 16 and a half Street um, to Pacific. So I will invite Laura up here. Laura, we're glad to have you. Thank you. Glad to be here. <laughs> Thank you, Councilman Ern and Davenport. Oh, God. Who's clicking? Oh, great. Okay. <laughs> um, 
So our goals and objectives. Um, <coughs> let me start by saying that a lot of this movement happened really with the Old Beach Farmers Market. And you've been to it. it it's kind of incubated there. These artisans um, had good success over the past eight years for having their goods. So they wanted to go to a more full-time thing. So this is, I think, going to be the right fit for them. But our goals and objectives here um, serve as a vibrant center for arts, culture, technology that's environmentally friendly. We want to enhance a sense of discovery for visitors and residents by revitalizing the area and making this uniquely ours to encourage the arts and artists as well as technical and creative resources to help them flourish and cross-pollinate. To support and expand the industry and creativity of those who live and work in the district, we want to stimulate the commerce and enhance quality of life for citizens in Virginia Beach and in this district foster rising real estate values by helping the district become a place where people want to be, assist in creating resources to help artists and artisans become established in our district. Mm -hmm. Creative businesses, what are they? Well, here, <coughs> here they are. Um, architecture, marketing, visual arts, design, film and media, video game, music, performing arts, publishing, culture, and culinary arts. So it's a real crossover of just all those creative fields. Um, and these are existing creative businesses. Um, we laugh all the time because the slide keeps updating with new ones that pop up. But um, these have just, and then the word that this is happening, more people have kind of congregated there. But here's who we have um, so far. And then the vendors that make up just the three markets are an additional um, Saturday appearance and then new businesses coming you've heard about Christina Chastain and her project on 17th Street hearth wood fire cuisine that's on 17th Street um, commune crepes is gonna co-op into the esoteric um, restaurant district project and Christine Ruth flowers she was um, a vendor at the market and um, had her flowers growing on one of the local farmers' farms, John Wilson. And the market was successful, and now she's doing a great business and is going to be full-time in the district. Um, we also know of a film and studio, art studio. We've heard of green businesses and offshore wind offices looking in this area, and some tech businesses in the Chesapeake Bay Distillery. So first Friday, what it is is an open house of businesses where you just go in and meet the artists, see the products, meet neighbors. It's very neighborhood um, oriented. It's walkable. So we'll, most people park at one spot and they kind of walk and meander through. Usually about 4 o'clock on Friday it goes to 7. A lot of cities, um, this has been their catalyst for getting their neighborhood started to have this kind of activity. So it's once a month and it's been doing really well and we just keep growing every month and then here's some pictures from chartreuse um, cindy pennybacker helped start this event over here with the surfboards that's um, oni tony and he was just recently in the virginia pilot with a nice article and then igor was in virginia living with the nice article in his work here's some ladies shopping okay <laughs> and um, back to the market so where a lot of this activity is just bringing people into the resort that just weren't coming in there. Maybe they'd come into the gym and leave, but they really started to walk around and experience it. And then we added the art market and the green market a couple years after the farmer's market. Terms for strategies. Thank you. Yeah. So to um, develop some near-term strategies, in front of you at your place is um, a draft ordinance um, establishing the districts and it also outlines um, some incentives for qualified new creative businesses. These incentives, we looked at uh, what other cities throughout um, Virginia are doing in terms of incentives and um, also what we in other parts of Virginia Beach in um, different sections um, what incentives we also are providing so we're looking at a b-pole rebate for um, 10 years uh, exemption from building code and zoning fees 
would be a rebate, um, partial real estate tax exemption for rehabilitated structures that are um, over 20 years old. It would be for 15 years. Uh, live work provisions. And um, it outlines in the ordinance that um, these businesses are eligible for economic development incentive program awards and investment partnerships if they meet the, the thresholds there. Uh, the Resort Advisory Committee has offered um, for some design help for businesses, Richmond. Um, they have been successful um, helping businesses with facade improvements and um, landscaping things. So Rack said that they would be able to help with um, some design assistance if um, property owners would like that. One of the other tools um, we are proposing is a revolving loan fund. There's a, a, a nonprofit um, that is in formation, these two individuals are um, spearheading the effort, and um, it would be a Vibe District nonprofit. They would administer these loans working with um, banks. They've secured some um, private contributions from the um, private sector at 50000 per year for three years. And um, the city manager's budget um, will include um, $100,000 for um, the Vibe District, um, our intent would be to have that money fund the city's match for these, um, this revolving loan fund. It would be administered by the nonprofit um, and vetted, um, the applications would be vetted by the um, committee and administered, the loans would be administered by the, um, by the committee and the nonprofit. We also um, looked at ways that we can identify a, um, and create a sense of place. So once we establish the district, um, we feel there's the need for branding and promotion of the district through signage and banners, temporary art, murals. Um, BCF has agreed to do some pro bono work for a year to help us with, um, draft, with creating these materials. Um, volunteers are working on um, a website and Facebook page and um, needs to, when you look at the walkability of this district, needs some improvement, sidewalks and connectivity to the businesses. So um, we need to develop a plan for that, um, as well as community, creating community building events, you know, possible street closures, block, block parties, different <clears throat> things like that to kind of create a um, community sense of um, around the district. The pop-up park um, adjacent to the convention center uh, where the lifeguard stands and boxes um, are a good first step, um, but love to have um, some additional green space in that area. So long-term strategies, uh, we need to leverage the arena um, infrastructure improvements with um, improved streetscapes and lighting, uh, link the Vibe District to the dome site and um, light rail, um, fund public improvement adjacent to private investment, and incorporate uh, the district into um, the updated comp plan. So we took um, two different scenarios um, when it comes to these um, proposed incentives. And um, we looked at if you know, a distillery would, would want to come to the district, um, the potential incentives would, that would be granted. Um, the conditional use permit fee rebate would be $900. Um, they don't have a, a no site plan would be needed. Um, but they would qualify for the economic development incentive programs and a BPOL rebate. A restaurant, artisan restaurant that fits the, the, the quali qualifying um, criteria um, would get a, a rebate of their conditional use permit, um, any site plan fees, and would be eligible for economic development incentive programs and a BPOL rebate. So this has been a really strong grassroots effort um, that will lead to increased positive business activity, a more active year-round resort, and really help shape our city's identity uh, through the arts. 
the excitement is building. Um, economic development has seen an increase in the interest in the district. So um, we are very encouraged with by that. So the next steps uh, would be um, in the next month, um, if you so choose, vote on the ordinance to create the district, um, finalize the concept of the revolving loan fund with the community partners, implement building, uh, community building events within the district, create branding, install banners, signage, and um, look for a nonprofit arts partner to anchor the district with space focused on the production of art, such as a welding studio, graphic design, ceramics. And really encourage the Vibe District businesses to continue to organize themselves because they've done a great job so far. So we are here to thank you. I'm here to take any questions. Um, I appreciate your time. Questions or comments? Mr. Hearn? Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I've been doing business down at the Virginia Beach Oceanfront for, believe it or not, over 30 years now. And during that entire period of time, we've lamented the fact that there's been no real reinvestment in the core of the resort. Uh, and so to, to see the excitement that's happening with this concept, is it's really, it's really something else. And, and I've been to countless meetings where you have these small business owners that are getting together, and they, and they believe it. I mean, they really believe it. Uh, and the fact that you have... Uh, you, you know, a lot of and there's, it's not just young people; it's it's young people, older people, and uh, but they're very they believe in the concept and and they believe in being together. I mean, it's really nice to see, uh, you know, in the competitive business environment that we all work in, that you also have people that are collaborating and, and working together uh, for a common good, and that's uh, that's certainly what I've seen 100 percent with these small business folks. So uh, it certainly was. Uh, it was wonderful to see the council embrace it as much as they did at the uh, at our last retreat. As you know, it was one of our highest priorities, and uh, I'm I'm excited to see that they we're actually going to put some teeth into it. And and really, the council's actions, even though here, you, you, when you read through the ordinance, the, the incentives are not large in nature, uh, but it certainly uh, signals, I think, to folks that are interested in. Uh, investing and reinvesting in that area uh, that the city also believes it and that we're behind it. And I, I appreciate the council's attention to that. Rosemary? I'm oh, sorry, I'm late. I have a funeral I was at. But, um, anyway, y'all remember a few years back, and I know Johnny's really going to remember when we were trying to say Peppers. Mm -hmm. And we were trying to get that to be an art historical district then. And we can't do it by ourselves. It's really the business community has got to step up and, and then we can be partners and do this together. So we we didn't say Peppers, which I was really sad about, or the Rolling Court Theater, um, which would have been cool to be part of the vibe. So we just have to accept what we have left and and try to save what we can and have this adaptive reuse. And, and I know that there's a lot of historical tax credits for adaptive reuse, and I hope that people will go after those, but uh, I couldn't be happier. It's really awesome. John Moss. Well, I hope we, we do need to do a detailed assessment on the, the revenue law, tax expenditure, since clearly we just took taxes away from the elderly trying to hold on to their homes, and now we're giving money away. But at the retreat, you may recall, I mentioned that you know, homeowners, which are 85, 80 percent of our tax base, they're struggling to maintain their homes and stay here and remain viable. And we've yet to tackle the issue of, you know, where is their incentive, you know, to rebate part of their property taxes, they renovate their properties and make it more vital. And that has a much more significant impact on our tax base as a whole volume than does the business community because how big of our tax base it is. So I think we need to make sure as we as we go on with more and more tax expenditures, while we talk about raising taxes, we need to make sure that the biggest generator of revenue in our city is residents. We need to make sure that we have or look at how we can enable like programs to renovate and revitalize the biggest portion of our tax base. And I think they're the lost stockholders in our conversations. And special interest groups seem to dominate all the conversation time. But these people really do need to have their concerns and their issues. And when you go door to door, and I know some of you have, when you're walking and you're campaigning and you move from the curb and get closer to the house, 
I mean, it's a real eye opener of what you see and the people that you talk to. So I think the housing stock really is, should be something that's of concern to us. And I think there, these things have a greater application than just you. Rosemary? And John, I think the council agrees with you because at the, at the retreat, we made it a, um, a high priority because of the aging housing stock that we really got to have some attention to that. Um, because 50 years is when you're considered an antique. <laughs> and if you look at how much housing, <laughs> I, I, you know, <laughs> you're really hitting below the belt. There. <laughs> you got me. <laughs> so um, we highly meant, especially in 10 years, what percentage of our houses are going to be at that point? So I think that was one of the reasons that at the retreat when I brought this up, just about everybody around the table agreed and said we've got to do something about it and uh, made it a high priority. Barbara? Uh, in looking at the map, um, I think it's, you know, it's, it's such a neat concept and we've long been wondering, you know, what could happen to change 17th Street, which is such an entrance to the, the city and, and this is really a, a neat idea. Um, and that particular uh, neighborhood there, actually 17th Street, between 17th Street and 16th Street, you've got a half a block that's commercial and a half a block that's residential. And so this is really a great transition to, to into that very stable neighborhood, which we, we certainly want to maintain. And, and thinking in terms of the arena as a project here, this, this is one of my concerns is whether or not what's going to happen around the arena. Uh, I just wonder why this doesn't extend farther uh, down, uh, whatever it is, 17th Street, into that arena district. Is it because it's more commercial or just unknown territory or you know, we're going to leave a no man's land there? What's it going to be uh, in that area? I, I think the answer is it was unknown land. <laughs> It's been a very dynamic process, and everything changes around us all the time. So we decided we better just go ahead, define ourselves, and move forward. We hope that the other things will develop, but we're, we're sure that we'll develop. So that's that's really the answer. I don't think could add on to that, well, Barbara. Say, go ahead. Yeah, if I could, all right. I mean, I think what happens as a result of spillover from the arena has been a great concern right. to the residential. And I so this is great for that part of 17th Street, but what about the other I, And I don't disagree with you. If you look at it, really, the, the part that's directly adjacent to that is, is city-owned, the part on 17th Street on the other side. On the other side, yeah. And, uh -huh, and the, my suggestion to them, right or wrong, was that if you make it too big, you don't get the critical mass. And that you can always expand the borders in the future if you find that you've had a great success and additional need. But that if you made it so big that you'd have everybody spread out and then you don't have that walkable district and you don't have that early success. So, uh, but I mean, you know, it's certainly up to the purview of the council to change the boundaries however they want. Well, for sure. But I mean, when we get to this item on the agenda today dealing with the arena, I think that was one of the comments, mm -hmm. you know, from some of the speakers. Uh, that had, had spoken about that is, you know, how that is going to impact. And I just think, well, anyway, I don't want to, to uh, contaminate your wonderful uh, proposal with, with such an unknown. But, it, you know, I was really hoping when I was looking at the area that it was going to be uh, uh, farther down, too, and help resolve this problem. So we still have to figure out what's going to happen down there and how we're going to buffer everything around it from spillover from the arena. Well, if that would make you feel comfortable, I will change that map right now, Mrs. Henley. <laughs> I'd be happy to do it. I think you're doing a great job, and I'm so glad because, I, I, you know, looking at where Cook School is, that's kind of close to me and, and everything. It's, it's, it's a wonderful neighborhood in there, and I think mm -hmm. this is great for those folks who probably wondered a long time what's going to happen to 17th Street as it's deteriorating. And their support. Um, yeah. Amelia? No, I think it's a great idea with the creative arts, and I can see down the road, if you go like how we have the Strawberry Festival and that whole mass, something can happen to divide this with having a candle, a whole group of people coming in just from the mm -hmm. August Street area. So this is great. Other questions or comments? Tell me about 
first Friday vibe night? Well, it happens every, every Friday or every month on the first Friday. And um, chartreuse, Crocs, um, found objects, all the businesses have um, an open house. It's all from Portal 7. Mm -hmm. Got um, to get one of those. We all got to get yeah, one Yeah, so you just can walk around the district and park and, right. and um, enjoy the food and drinks at Crocs and um, make your way throughout the district. I can so. make that happen. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Thank you nice all very much. Trip. Thank you. Great to have you here. Okay, another exciting thing from what I read in the newspaper, uh, Mr. Uh, Spore. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Mike Eason, who is our resort management administrator, has been approached uh, on a pretty unique and spectacular uh, entertainment venue that wants to come to Virginia Beach this summer. Mike, right, we're glad to have you. Thank you, Mayor, members of council. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, yeah, we do have some exciting news for our residents and visitors for this summer. Circus Lay is coming to town. So we're here to tell you, give you some background information and to tell you a little bit about the permitting process that we're going to be using to allow it. And hopefully, if you're asked at a cocktail party what's happening, you'll be able to, to answer the questions. If you look at the, uh, the I want to tell you a little bit about the show itself. Um, Kuza is one of six uh, shows that is produced by Circus Soleil that travels around the world. This particular show has been in Europe for the last two years. It's coming in North America. Uh, it is a very family-friendly show. Um, and we're in good company. Uh, while it's touring in North America, it's going to be in Pittsburgh, Virginia Beach, New Orleans, Austin, and Columbus. So we're in good company. Um, moving on. The show uh, begins set up. Um, and let me tell you a little bit about the, uh, the show. Um, this show comes with, in 50 tractor-trailer loads of equipment. Uh, and it's such a laborious to put it up. They have to stay a fairly long length of time to make the, the numbers work for them. So, again, they'll be setting up uh, June 21st. Um, and there'll be 39 shows beginning on July 15th and running through August 15th. The shows will run Tuesdays through Sundays and with matinees. Most of the shows during the week begin at 8 o'clock at night, and that helps Courtney, and I'll tell you why in just a moment. Uh, some of the matinees will occur on Friday, Saturdays, and Sundays. They have options for seven additional shows if ticket sales go well, and we hope they will um, because we want them to come back, obviously. Um, the site will be cleared and restored by August 28th. So it's, it's a long period of time, and that's been a challenge, but we'll get into that in just a moment. What I'd like to show you just, uh, is just a one-minute um, teaser video on the show to just give you a flavor for uh, what you'll be seeing. Pretty exciting yeah. stuff. Um, I've, I know some people, including Doug Smith, that said he's been to similar shows, and uh, he said they're really spectacular. I think the, the nice part about it is that they're, um, it's a 2,500-seat uh, tent, but they're right on top of you when they perform. So you're, it's not like you're sitting up in the, in the nosebleed section somewhere. You're going to be down and close and personal. Um, when we first started talking to uh, the representatives, um, we started evaluating several sites in the resort. Um, but really the one that really fitted their needs the most and it could accommodate them because they're just because of their sheer size was the convention center parking lot. Uh, and in particular, lot five, which is over all the way against Virginia Beach Boulevard. <coughs> and the reason we wanted to use that, there was no, there weren't a whole lot of trees and stuff in there. And Courtney will talk a little bit more about that later, but it really served and needed, fit their, fit their needs, uh, almost, uh, uh, exactly. So the proposal here after meeting with, um, Karen Lasley and Bill McCauley and others is to do two permits. One would be a special permit um, from my office, and that would cover anything to coordinate the, the, uh, the uh, issues with uh, permits inspections, fire department, uh, zoning, uh, police, and so on and so forth. And then the second would be 
a use permit that Courtney would, uh, would have them sign, which covers a whole another gamut of other things. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Courtney. He'll cover the site plan and some of the conditions for his permit. Courtney, glad to have you. Glad to be here. This is pretty exciting stuff, and we're pretty excited about it. it. You know, summer is a little slower for the convention center. People don't always like the hotel rates that go along with meetings in the summer, but we, we keep it pretty busy, but this is a great time for us. The, the performances are um, mid-July through mid-August. We can um, show the site, pl the site layout. Um, here's where we will be, and, and the, the folks at Cirque du Soleil, and I have to pronounce that right. I never took French, but it's Cirque du Soleil. Um, they sent an engineer down here, a construction manager. They shot points all over our parking lot to, to, uh, to measure elevations. This is the old uh, construction staging lot that they would, we anticipate they will stage all of the 50 trailers that come along with it. The big top sits in here. Uh, there is a fence, an eight-foot high fence that totally surrounds the site. That's for privacy, it's back of house uh, area. But you've got Virginia Beach Boulevard over here, Judeo Christian Outreach Center. This is our stormwater pond. Just for reference, the arena footprint is over here eventually, and 19th Street to the north. So um, we would have to take down some light poles, some islands. They're used to doing this, they're construction engineers that manage that. They would res resurface the asphalt afterwards because. The stakes that they put in the ground, they call them pins, they're two inches in diameter and five feet long to hold the bases down into the earth that hold these big structures up. There's a really cool YouTube video if you want, if you get a few extra minutes, if you go on YouTube and, and Google Kooza, K-O-O-Z-A, every town that they've been to produces a really cool video. There's one from Vancouver that's pretty neat, two minutes long, and it shows uh, how they raise it. Uh, lease payment, uh, we're, we have come to an agreement so far on a $60,000 lease for the property. I've got some obligations for traffic management in there, but uh, I f the admission tax alone could be a quarter of a million dollars for this thing. So it's uh, a, a big deal. They want 500 parking spaces that would be shared with other events uh, in the convention center, and we feel like in the summertime we can manage that okay. They have some VIP parking for premier ticket holders and um, accessible parking against the structure. Uh, the back of house would be screened from the view. The sound from the show shouldn't exceed the no noise uh, limits. Certainly won't be any louder than the jet noise over there. And uh, they'll restore the site uh, to the level that we, uh, to the existing level. So we're real excited about it. Uh, anybody have any questions? Any questions, John? If this doesn't get y'all excited, I don't know what it does. Yeah, I mean, this is pretty exciting. I, I really wanted to uh, take it just a quick minute and thank both Mike and Courtney for their help with this. Uh, you know, when uh, the, the show that we had last year decided not to re-up, Mike actually took the initiative and, and reached out to the Cirque du Soleil folks to see if they had any interest in it. It took them a little while, but, I mean, it, it's really uh, uh, because of that effort that, that we uh, have this opportunity to consider today. And then, you know, Courtney... You know, as an operations person, I mean, for him to actually step up and say, listen, this is, this is how we can make this happen, uh, I think it's just really commendable for a city staff. And I th I'd like to thank both of y'all. Thank All you right. so very much. All right. Oh, Thanks. Barbara, you wanted to extend the map. It looks like we just did. Appreciate <laughs> <laughs> it. Thank y'all for coming down. All right, Mr. Spore. The... Uh, Next thing is a light rail transit extension update. Right. Uh, Mayor and members of the council, the Federal Transit Administration uh, signed off on the draft environmental impact statement. You have copies of the document itself at your, at your place in those uh, manila uh, envelopes. There are a couple of uh, much thicker uh, appendices, if anybody's interested in those, as well as a thumb drive on that. Uh, Dave Hansen's here to, to talk to you about it. We thought it was important, uh, and we've been waiting for FDA to sign off since really the end of last year. But as soon as that happened, to try and get to council and talk about where we are in terms of our analysis in conjunction with HRT and the city staff uh, in terms of recommending uh, a way forward and a schedule and try and get that information out to the public as soon as uh, possible. So that was today. So uh, Dave Hansen's here to walk you through this. Sure. Dave, Thank glad you. to have you. 
Thank you, Mayor, members of council, city manager. Uh, I'm joined today by Ram Marusa, Julie and Tim, who are from HRT, our partners in the uh, in the uh, DEIS, in the Environmental Impact Statement Study. Um, and uh, these are our agenda items today. First of all, to update to, as the manager said, it's a it's a crucial period that we were hoping to reach so that we could come forth, provide an update. We haven't had a discussion since your uh, workshop on light rail. And uh, we also want to just uh, just come right out and provide the staff recommendation uh, with regards to uh, what we think is the uh, appropriate way to proceed. Uh, I'm going to explain some factors and considerations about how we got to our staff position with regards to this minimal operational segment, the extension of light rail, the blue line, and uh, to town center. And then uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the shared use pathway and what we learned going down to Charlotte and, and, and an additional expense associated with, with creating not only uh, a light rail transit system, but also the multimodal capacity for riders and walkers to get to and from and utilize the stations and to incentivize transit-oriented development, which will be a huge increase in our, uh, our ability to meet the transitioning urban development uh, goals of our strategic growth area plans, and then finally, briefly talk about costs and funding and expenditures because those are all going to wrap right ba back as we look at the potential of giving you an economic analysis brief uh, that backs up most of our recommendations. Uh, right on the bet uh, and on your cover sheet, uh, those are, everybody got a read ahead chart pack, but if you got a cross cut on the cover, you got the latest version sitting in front of you today. So there'll be some changes uh, over the weekend, but we really tried to get you a, a read ahead out so that you had something to sink your teeth into during the weekend. Cause I know you were just dying to read something, but, uh, most important on this first chart is that, uh, they have posted, uh, uh, with the EPA, our DEIS, and as you can see, on the 20th, uh, the EPA will publish it in the Federal Registry. Uh, Cha-ching! That starts the 45-day public comment period, and uh, our HRT partners are going to be uh, performing four public hearings, and uh, that information is going out in press releases and uh, will be known to a lot of folks. Uh, and then uh, potentially uh, we, will, or we will see the end of the comment period on the, on the 4th of May. So what are the next city council activities, focusing in on what your duties are? First of all, we're going to add a fifth one. You're going to get a public hearing. We're going to schedule that on your agenda for the April 21st so that the public has an opportunity to come in direct with you, the city council. And, I don't know if we have to have dinner or something set up for that, but uh, I think it'll be an exciting time. Um, and then potentially as early as, as early as the 5th of May. Now, that'll be probably contingent upon how the comments are being processed at HRT. Are they getting a list of the comments back to the city? Are we having a running dialogue from HRT so we can see the evolution of those comments? And then they have the responsibility of responding to this. So we'll see how fast they're kicking out those responses. And then we'll see what the duplication effort is, et cetera. And depending on whether or not we feel like they're caught up on those comments and caught up on those responses, and with the city council's comfort, as early as 5 May, you could potentially make your locally preferred uh, uh, alternative decision with regards to where we're going. But today I'm going to give you our staff recommendation on what the heck that is. But before I jump right to that, I thought I'd just bring everybody back to some common ground. And there may be some different persuasions associated with some of these uh, thoughts that are in this sheet. But... Um, I just want to make sure that we're talking about a, uh, a minimal operational segment being an affordable piece of light rail transit that can be built. You certainly can't have or figure out a financing scheme that will pay for $1.3 billion to go all the way to the beach right off the top. That would be extremely difficult to do. 
And so what a minimal operational segment that we feel is appropriate and is affordable is potentially from Newport, Newtown to Virginia Beach's town center. Uh, we believe that uh, uh, assuming uh, and building on the investment technology, uh, the investment that uh, the city of Norfolk, the Commonwealth of Virginia, and the Federal Transit Authority invested in uh, is, is the proper way to go at this point. Uh, we aren't just planning for a single MOS extension of light rail. We're actually trying to uh, implement Vision 2040, a connected community. Uh, that opens the opportunity for us to, to look at creating a south side transit system, uh, which is more than just the blue line to town center, from Newtown to town center. It's much bigger than that, and we'll show you what that is. And the fact that uh, the opportunity to, uh, to strategize and program a whole south side transit system gives us an opportunity to create the Union Station at that terminus inside the town center uh, and give us a Union Station location. Uh, design of that Union Station is extremely important because many of us believe that the cost associated with continuing the current technology is unaffordable. And we believe that building on the current technology, connecting the two town centers is extremely important. Building a union station that allows the transition to a different technology is extremely important. What I'm actually saying is the current system is a smart track and a dumb vehicle. Our enemy here in Virginia Beach is distance. We're 302 miles, square miles of city, and we got a lot of distance between where we are and where we want to go. So converting your engineering technology to dumb track, smart vehicle, gives you two to two and a half more times the amount of track distance per dollar spent than you do in the current system. And as we know, Councilman Jim Wood was dispatched to Japan on a sister city's mission liaison, and we sent him a day early and asked him to go find an urban maglev to which he rode and came back and gave us a, an update and showed us some video. And so we know it exists, and we think that creating a union station that allow us to change that technology and get more bang for a dollar is very important. Uh, taking advantage of an unprecedented 50% cost share provided by the Commonwealth, that window is before us. We're going we're to come by and either we grab that pile of cash or we pass it up. And that's a heavy council decision to, to make. Um, it all began with, began with your approval of the town center. And that's the transformation from being America's largest town to becoming the greatest city in the world. And that transformation that started with Town Center, which has led to your approval of all the SGA plans, specifically the six along the center line of the Norfolk Southern right away, right Virginia Beach Boulevard and Laskin Road, the backbone of that system is based upon having a transit system. Uh, we're really moving forward to become a Vision 2040 city. And as we, as we came to grips at your workshop uh, uh, just a month ago in, in, in realizing that those decisions are upon us, we, uh, we are now making a decision of whether or not that spine needs to be put in place, that we should connect the two town centers of Norfolk and Virginia Beach and set the conditions for growing into a full-fledged city. Okay. So what is the Virginia Beach Transit Extension Study? Well, it started out with just these three alternatives. Newtown Road to Rosemont, Newtown Road to Oceanfront along the Norfolk Southern Corridor 
or uh, Newtown Road to the ocean front, switching over somewhere in the Great Neck area, getting on Alaskan Road through Hilltop, and then coming down Bird Neck to Pacific Avenue. We took a look at these money options that were emerging and we said, oh my gosh, you know, that's nice, but there's not enough tea in China right now for us to be able to afford those, those extensions, those minimal operational segments. And so we asked the HRT to add another alternative. And because it was in linear distance, they backed it up, inserted it as 1A, and that's Newtown to Town Center. And they had a range of price that we felt like with the state providing 50% at 155, we could bring this project in at 310. So due to affordability, we are recommending that the city council solely focus their decision on implementing alternative one and that the public during this public comment period spend their energy in looking at that town center alternative to look at with the stationing and the aspects associated with just that minimal operational segment. Because quite frankly, council, any EIS you produce expires after five years. And you have to generate an, an update to the EIS. And as fast as the city is moving, even in these constricting fiscal environmental times, we are grow so fast that you're going to get a redo in about 10 years when you get ready to build your second MOS. And we'll talk about that a little later of what those, what those uh, segments are. So what is, bottom line up front, what is the staff recommendation? Staff recommendation is that we focus on alternative 1A and we design and build a four-station scenario. Certainly, we have to modify Newtown, and we have to construct the Wichduck Station, which will be right adjacent across from the HRC. You all are investing $27 plus million plus in an HRC developing the Wichduck Corridor, so it makes sense that we put our light rail station right there. And then we move into the Pembroke Town Center area, and when we show you all the factors and considerations of how we go about analyzing how you station, how you, how you locate those stations and the rationale for those stations, that you focus on constructing the Kellum and the Constitution stations because it's the easiest access for the greatest number. It's the cheapest to build because they all are at grade. They're not up in the air. They are space to operation to operationally maximize the coverage area at the quarter mile and the half mile distances, which is the industry standard for transit oriented development. They are uh, less developed areas than we currently have, thereby making themselves available to consider the park and rides or the parking garages associated with supporting them. They provide, in this case, Constitution, the best opportunity to provide a north-south line and thereby create the Union Station that supports a tra technology transition and supports the red line, the green line, and the goal lines. It avoids congestion by packing it right into town center where you're already congested because the buses and the kissing rides and all the parking that goes on associated with getting on light rail. And quite frankly, at the end of the day, it allows us to make decisions of affordability for the following. So what are we talking about when we start looking at uh, Vision 2040 and we go from what we look like today to potentially what the build out of transit oriented development could be? Well, the original statement, the original study, the study that's ongoing right now is looking at four alternatives. Number one, you're headed eastbound, and there's independence. So we deadhead the current light rail system at grade on the west side of independence, and you put a pedestrian walkway across independence. Okay, next alternative for stationing is you build a Union Station across the boulevard, and you have a tail track that comes down to grade, but it's above grade. The third alternative is you shift it to Market Street, 
still above grade because you cannot get down to grade, so you have to extend that above grade sector. And then the fourth is to the Constitution Drive past our uh, municipal BMP uh, where it's at grade, comes down off the ramp at Independence, it gets to grade, and that heads right there. But there are two other stations that were recommended by when we brought in UDA to look at other alternatives. And so with this chart, you can see the four stations I just told you about where they're located. And now we wanted to say, you know, you get down that road of a study and they're doing a great job, but all of a sudden we really get serious about looking at this thing and saying, how do you maximize your investment? Because we're talking serious dollars here. We to back up a little bit to the west and say, look at Kellum. This is a major venue. It's yet to be developed, has a great capability to support surface parking and maybe parking garages in the future if you can get economic, if you can get uh, cost participation with uh, with private enterprise. And then on the other hand, when you look at deadheading it on the west side of Constitution, doesn't it make sense to push over to the east side and potentially the renovation, the revitalization of the theaters connected to a parking garage, Universal Studios kind of really taken off, the place to be, because it's going to be at grade. And can you imagine north-south, south side transit system coming in above grade and going north to the, to the airport, et cetera? So we added those two in our analysis. So now we got six stations we had to look at. And it's always good to blow the computer. Um, OK, so I put a chart in there so that you could say, well, how the heck do you go about figuring out where to position a station? What are the considerations associated with selecting your light rail stations? Now, if we do the purple line to Greenbrier and we come off the Lynn Haven Parkway, where do you want your stations? How do you position those through Centerville? I mean, these are considerations that apply throughout the process that HRT applies, that all, you, all municipalities and jurisdictions do. And you can see what they are. And these are industry standards. Give me some quarter mile, give me some half mile radiuses. Tell me how you drop off, what's the parking, ridership potential, station maxim, walking, and then ultimately a union station. So what is the south side transit system? Well, there it is. Blue line extending from Newtown to Town Center. Goal line A to Great Neck. Goal line B from Great Neck through Hilltop to Pacific Avenue. Red line north to Little Creek and the airport. The green line south to our Centera and our TCC and the Municipal Center. And then I added the purple line because... Councilman Dyer and I were talking about the article in the paper that said Chesapeake was interested in figuring out how to get into the transit system, and they were going to go right up the interstate, and I said, gee, we can probably connect them to a system a lot cheaper than going up through that property, because it's very tight, it's all interstate, and it's got a lot of water. Uh, if you apply all those principles, you start to get diagrams that show you the north-south corridors, show you what the economic development pieces are, show you the quarter mile and the half mile radiuses of each one of the selections, and then do some combining to say, okay, what does it look like if you do Market Street and Kellum, or maximize it at Kellum and Constitution? And this, this is a busy chart, but it's really a summary chart of all the individual ones I want to walk you through following that up. So what is the North-South Corridor? We did an analysis and we said, of all those four stations, which one's the best? Well, it's Constitution. Which one's the worst? Market. Because I really can't go north and south if you go to market. I can't get through town center. It's already built up. It's in the air. I cannot get a north-south line through there. So you'd have to extend another junction somewhere in order to go north-south if that's the intent. We could say, okay, we're going to focus on one MOS. We're done. That's it. You can make that statement, and that would be your strategy going forward, in which case I probably agree. We need to rethink our study. But if the 2040 strategy of a fully connected city is what you want to do, then you've got to pursue an analysis of how to advance. You know, this at-grade thing versus above-grade is serious business. Um, 
There's a lot of literature out there that says that grade develops TOD much faster. It gives you a community feel of walking, of biking, of getting to it, and it's a whole lot cheaper to build them than it is with the famous Brambleton above ground station. And uh, I'm certainly not thinking that's probably the type of design we would want to consider if we go down that road. And uh, we, won't, we won't mention certain council members that have told me they would just absolutely want to throw me out of the office if I brought something like that in. But anyway, those are the rationale. Let's look at transit-oriented development, build-out. Let's kind of crawl, walk, run into that on those uh, Kellum. What's the potential that hasn't happened? Independence, both sides of independence, what's the potential? Market Street, what is the potential? And then Constitution, what is the potential? That's a UDA kind of an illustrative to say visually that tells you a lot. Okay, so convert it to some numbers. Start to convert that visual to some numbers. This is a simple crawl, walk, run chart that says this is your existing acreage of development and this is your potential with your total in the bottom. And so if you really want to say, what's the max potential, you kind of focus in on that line. But acres, what does acres tell you? Well, that's kind of hand grenade range, and I think you want to put a bullet on target when you start talking about this kind of an investment. What's in those economic development numbers? Well, it's the type of development. It's residential, it's office, it's commercial, it's hotels, and it's industrial likely moving out and relocating to why we invested in the London Bridge Road and the BRAC and all that commercial, that industrial area associated there, or revitalizing themselves to be in that urban setting, because both can exist. Most importantly is these three categories, and I need the council to really understand these three categories, because this is the heart of the economic analysis that we have done. And we have provided, we have a ro report completed, we have briefing charts completed, we're gonna put a cover letter on it, we're gonna send it to you, we're gonna let you study it, and if you decide you wanna have a briefing, we'll come back and walk you through that. But when you do your analysis, you have this number up top, and that's the SGA plan total build-out number. So that's 100. That's 100% of what you could potentially do over the entire life of the SGA. And so when you do this analysis, you figure out, well, what would 25% of that total build-out be, called modest? What would the average be? That's just 50% of the total build-out. And what would optimistic be? 75% of the build-out, because nobody believes that we can get 100% of that maximized printout of acres and colors and all that would happen. <coughs> and so we give you square footage, number of units, and number of rooms associated with modest. It's currently in Newtown. And then what is the Wichita Kellum Constitution? Because that is a staff recommendation. What could that potentially give you at 25% of the total build-out, at 50% of the total build-out? and of the witch duck uh, of the 75%. And so you see tools in your packet such as this at Newtown, quarter mile. And it's kind of cool like a stoplight. Green says, probably going to transition and build out first. Amber, probably going to transition and revitalize second. Red. Low potential, probably got something good on it, going to take a while for it to evolve. And then anything brown or, or gray like this, not going to transition, big, big neighborhoods, et cetera, like that. So here's your existing Newtown Road. Here are the numbers that substantiate that. We've got an economic analysis that backs that up, but we wanted to provide that to you so that you knew exactly what the potential is for those SGAs. And then when you really start to focus in on the main trunk from Witch Duck, Hellum, and Constitution, you see the maximization of your investment to stations. 
And when you do the analysis, you must remove the duplication of each of those stations so that you're not cheating and that you're honest in your economic analysis. And so here we are, Southern Boulevard. Y'all bought Kempsville Lumber, so you own this piece over here to the left. <laughs> And there's the <laughs> railway, and we're looking east. So can you imagine your HRC on the corner bent around just like that? And your station either here or your station over there to be determined. And then how about Kellum? Here's Kellum. Here's town center. You're looking at the intersection, and gosh, that's what it might be. And those are the uh, square footages. There's Pembroke uh, at Independence. Remember I told you that would have to be above Independence, be kind of congested, be it tight, but you'd have to build something that would support all that parking as well as pedestrian access. Market Street extending from Independence, which is over there, headed this way to the, to the east behind us. And then Constitution Drive, uh, looking backwards at Town Center, and potentially what it could become uh, if you partner with the owner of the movie theaters and go into a joint venture that says, how cool would that be to revitalize those theaters and then develop that entire parcel all the way up to Virginia Beach Vault. There's great opportunity and huge numbers on this sheet of paper. So how much does it generate? We pulled a couple charts out of the economic analysis. This is marginal annual. How much does it generate? And here it is years 1 through 10, years 11 through 20. And, and what is the average? Of course, it'll be more in year 20 than it will be in year 11. But the average during that on an annual basis, how much real estate tax at a modest level, 50% of the line, will it produce? And what's that graph look like? So we talk about the quality, meaning we, we rank order class AA, class A, class B. And we pick the middle of the road, class A associated with that. And we have in our economic analysis an understanding of what double A to B in the middle, class A type investments are. Economic cycle, you'll see these little dips. These are the little recessions that reflect zero growth. And coming out of those recessions, only 0.5 GDP of 1%, half a percent coming out of those recessions are inculcated into the economic analysis. I've talked about the type of redevelopment, hotels, residential apartments, uh, retail, and then uh, proximity, quarter, half mile, and then we maintain 93 cents on the dollar just so we didn't have to project. <coughs> All right, so what is the cumulative? How much money have you put in the bank over a 20-year period? of only real estate taxes generated by Newtown, Woodstock, Kellum, and Constitution. And what does that graph look like? And this is a pretty important graph. It shows you the total build-out line if maximized in the SGA plan. It shows you the optimistic line, and then we greened out the average line so that you could see the cumulative real estate taxes Growth, and that gives you the upper and the lower limits. And below that, of course, is the 25% modest build out. Uh, we'll provide you a larger chart. I just wanted to show you a decision matrix that evaluates all this stuff. You're, you're talking about station selection and how do you go about your business as a staff to do that. And it gives you a number, high number is best. And when you really combine Kellum and Constitution, you get the best number on the table. But once again, the staff recommendation that talks about Kellum and talks about the terminus being a constitution. But there's something additional that goes along with a light rail station and a light rail line, and that is the access to it and the transit-oriented development that goes along. 
And currently, HRT is not including any parallel east-west pedestrian bike connectivity improvements. And that's pretty important to you all, having been with you for so long and know what your perspectives are. So we independently are placing into the, the next budget the opportunity to pursue that design in parallel with the 30% design that HRT is going to do to be able to bring that online at the same time as an ad option item in the bidding for the RFP associated with building the light rail line. So what am I talking about? Because that just made a lot of sense. Well, we packed up a bunch of the bicycle guys and a bunch of staffers and put some helmets on them and shot them down there to Charlotte and said, okay, go down there and look at this shared use bike station that's down there and go for a ride along their rail line and by gosh they found 28 feet of width across the tracks and 10 foot 10 to 16 foot bike paths and what they noticed is look at the transit oriented development that blew up next to it it's pretty amazing when you see the numbers and uh you could see that retail, nightlife, and you could see that not only did they like what they had, but the developer said, I want to create a retaining wall, I want to have this, I want my gardens, I want my step-ins, I want access to my flats from that. Because that's a great selling point with regards to urban planning and urban development. And most of you all that deal with millennials know some of their perspectives about how they want to live and how they want to develop their professional life. So what are we talking about? <clears throat> well, the HRT guys are going to do a 30% design. And their 30% design is going to be this. It's going to be curved and ballast and curved. And then they're going to have a swale. And then they're going to have a gravel road. And they're going to put French drain style piping in here. And then it'll have a collection pipe. And it'll come out and there'll be a little concrete wall and it'll <coughs> pour down the swale and get in the ditch and it'll move to a BMP collection area associated with stormwater management. That's their design. Our request is let's consider stormwater systems that takes it out, puts it into stormwater control, adds a uh, five foot sidewalk, adds a any dimensions, there's two of them shown here, but adds a 14-foot dimensional uh, bike path and pedestrian walking, fully supportive of maintenance vehicles that run parallel to it to incentivize transit-oriented development and to create that sense of community that you all have asked for. Gravel. Oh, yeah, the gravel goes away. You have to put in your stormwater management system. You have to collection, but you have... You had those multimodal pathways running on both sides of it. And so that kind of represents uh, what it does. Uh, I think we're all aware of the top priority of the bikeway and trails plan. And it maintains our quality of life. And also, this last bullet is pretty, pretty important. And that is develop, say, connectivity over independence for pedestrians and bikers to get from one quadrant to the other. And uh, just the next steps are that we, uh, we figure out a way to uh, design this, to create an ad option. What if I am correct that we can deliver light rail, the concepts that we want for 280,000, and we still got 30,000 on the table? We want that ad option. Million, 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 million. I'll million. take it It's all million. <laughs> Depends I'll what project I'll comes John Moss for that one. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thank you very much. Now you're right. talking, Will. <laughs> I build a coalition every day. Privately uh, financed. <laughs> so here we are in uh, what's it cost? Put a cost sheet in there. Uh, the current estimate uh, from HRT is in that $327 million arena. It's got some right-of-ways in there. It's got some other costs that are already... In the, uh, in the expense column, uh, but they are covering all their costs, and we have not stepped in or messed with their cost estimating. We will not fall to the pitfall that occurred over in Norfolk when they had to lower those cost estimates to make the 
square peg fitting the round hole. Uh, we're kind of uh, staying in line with them. But we believe that we can work our scoping in the RFP to stay within 310 and our commitment uh, to match the 155 that the state's going to provide us. One of the big things is that you're going to have to create a significantly greater bus service associated with servicing light rail transit, both from an FTA perspective, but also from a uh, support to your citizenry and the business community to do that. And so what are the operational costs? I think that's important to discuss because, you know, you currently will have an increase uh, startup cost of an additional $2.2 million in annual startup, and it'll probably subside to about $1.3 uh, Your bus, for some reason, the state uh, or the feds will not provide us the, uh, what's the right term, augmentation, sub supplanting grant process that offsets some of your costs until you've been in business for two years and then you can see it subsides down to there. So for years one and two you can see your annual operating costs and then what it'll stabilize at at years three and beyond. And those have to be dealt with. Funding strategy. Um, I can tell you that through the budget process thus far, Management Services has developed five options associated with looking at how to fund this, and that uh, the city manager will present those uh, that budgeting budget recommendation with his FY16 uh, two weeks from today, and that uh, he is currently engaged with uh, the council members with one-on-ones, and you're being advised what uh, what that recommendation is as we speak. And uh, there was some confusion uh, between what you think you may have to spend in the next year's budget versus what that total big giant number is associated with light rail and the associated. We think the maximum that needs to be spent in FY16 is $20 million. We're going to have to commit to a rail vehicle purchase, and we're going to have to do some engineering and some engineering oversight with the 30% design that HRT brings to the table, because they're going to put 30% design on top of the DEIS, and that'll give us a, a pretty good cost estimate, and those will adjust, those costs will adjust as they firm those up. And then what will happen is we're able to take bridging documents and put right on top of that uh, ability to to give that RFP to the street. Now, we're not just going to open it up to the street. We're going to go through a request for interest and a request for qualifications to put a series of competitive steps in place compliant with the Virginia Procurement Act. So when it's time to move to RFP, we have a bona fide group of qualified consortiums that can do this level of work, fully fully vetted, and inside the ring so that they are the three or four consortiums that get the RFP and they'll have a, a brief period to provide us their presentations and their bids associated with building our scope. So what's the timeline as I wrap this up? Um, I've given you that. Uh, we talked about that early on based upon <laughs> receipt of information regarding the public comment period. You may have to delay that a week, but if you add seven days to that, that's May 12th, and you'll recall that's your budget FY16 budget approval day. May be a serious day for decisions on the part of the city council if you have to delay it a week. Uh, because contained in the manager's budget is that projection of how this gets funded uh, throughout the CIP, though you'll only be appropriating for year one of the CIP. And then, you know, I talked a little bit about RFQs, RFIs, RFQs, and how that happens. And if you read this, you'll get a good idea how the contracting piece of this business how we convert words to deeds, that's what this process represents, is how we implement your will and intent to become Vision 2040 City. And with that, 
I will take your questions. Thank you very much for your presentation. Questions or comments at this time, John? I just have a process question first, because I know a substantial group that won't be filing until the 4th. Uh, and, and I know that, generally speaking, the process is that HRT is not only supposed to adjudicate the comments, but they're supposed to republish and show how those comments are addressed in the report. When will that information, this gets back to, I think that the public ought to have the ability to see everything that's been said before they have a chance to come down and talk to us. I think that makes sense on a process point of view. So I'm really interested in what their timeline is, assuming they get a professional critique, what they'll get, <laughs> of their report on the 4th of May. What's their time to, to process that kind of analytical critique? Sure, Ray. Come on up. Ray, we're glad to have you. Thank you, Mayor Sessions. Um, and uh, Councilman Moss, the comment period ends May 4th, and that begins the process of compiling all the comments received, whether it was verbal at the public hearings, whether it's by email, by written letter, or any other methodology that individuals, including federal and state regulatory agencies, may submit. We compile those comments, and the first thing we do after we compile them and sort them by areas of concern is we're going to send them to the Federal Transit Administration, because, again, it is their document. At the same time, we provide responses to those comments when we compile them to any substantive co comments. Uh, you know, if they point out that we called Independence Boulevard, Independence Avenue, duly noted, will be corrected. Those comments along the proposed responses go to FTA after May. It's going to take us a couple of weeks to assemble <laughs> all that. FTA reviews the comments and responses and may come back to us with a query for more information, may ask us to, uh, for further clarification of the information. All of that then becomes part and parcel of the final environmental impact statement, which is the next phase of development, which will begin in June. We're anticipating the FEIS and the 30 percent design to begin in June, and Dave's schedule, Mr. Hansen's schedule showed us completing that in the summer of 2016. So it's not part of the DEIS. It becomes part of the final environmental impact statement, part of that record. The DEIS that's released and available now, that's it. It has all the information, all the appendices. The comments and the responses to the comments are compiled and put into the FEIS. But one of the options they have based on the comments is to remain to go back and rework and retool the DEIS. It depends. It, it, part of the FEIS. Yes. Um, we will provide a summary of those comments, obviously, to you all as the body politic before your LPA vote so that you can see what the comments are. But they are part of the FEIS, not the DEIS. My point in all this is I think we need to have the benefit of what all the federal regulatory agencies have said. We should be seeing the full body of the testimony and HRT's critique, because that's what I think we owe, before we vote on a preferred alternative, because then we're voting on less than full information, and we're voting before we're at the point of the process by which all comments have been made known and are available to the public for them to read and come down and comment on. So I think that 5 May, there's no way that can happen. I mean, I, this is the process I'm familiar with, and it is further down the food chain. And I think that if we think we already know the answer and the public comment doesn't matter, well, then, of course, we can vote. But I don't think that's the case. I think we need to see what everyone has had to say, how it's adjudicated and its merits before we vote, or we're voting without complete information. I think that's what we owe the public. Do you already know of a group that's going to hold their comments to the fourth? Why would they do that? The, because we are working with university professors, other places to put together, do a professional critique. I mean, this is any other questions or comments, time. Bobby? Yeah, thank you. And, mm -hmm. and um, you know, I guess it's been pretty known. You know, Colonel, and, and you, you did a tremendous job on the report, but, you know, I still remain, you know, skeptical on light rail. And I guess a lot of it, it has to do with, you know, the uncertainty of the real costs that we're going to have to incur over time. And, you know, granted, this is, uh, you know, a good concept and everything, but, you know, once again, I think when it comes to light rail and this new stuff, is it practical, is it feasible, and is it affordable? And the thing is, one of my concerns about with uh, the Norfolk thing, it's dated technology, it's very expensive to maintain, and, and also concerns about a system that has w seawater problems in, in Norfolk. Part of the problem is it's not an elevated system that impedes traffic. Um, 
And then once again, are people going to regard it as a novelty of practicality? And I guess my main concern um, is how is this going to impact the other districts throughout the city? Is this going to create a massive su uh, substitution effect? Is there going to be a economic benefit at the detriment to all the other businesses? Because if you take people out of cars, they're not going to stop at the stores on the way home, pick up their dry cleaning and everything. And the other thing is I'm really concerned that we really need a system. And I think part of the frustration is that we're on the verge of many new technologies out there that I think are far superior to light rail that would offer us more of a system. And then also the barriers to success about we're not on a grid system that lends itself favorably to people, whether on Lake Christopher or Lake James, how do you get to a bus station? How do you get to, uh, where do you park your car to get to, you know, to a system? Are people going to use it? And, you know, if they're going to tag, you know, maybe another half hour plus on a, on a work day, probably, you know, it's the plus thing. I just think that there's a lot more questions than answers at this point. I don't think we've really, you know, delved into some of the alternatives. But what re really scares me, um, is it cheaper to live in Manhattan or, you know, Virginia Beach? You know, let's face it, Manhattan's got a lot of transit-oriented development up there. Very expensive in cities that have this. And the cost of government, and granted we're going to make some money with transit-oriented development, but what is it going to do to the cost of government in terms of what we're going to need from police, fire, EMS, uh, retrofitting some of the infrastructure and sewers and stormwater that we're going to need? Because as you go higher, I assume, you know, there might have to be some engineering costs there. What about the impacts of school, Princess Anne High School? Are we going to need a fifth precinct? And, you know, just be careful what we pray for. Other questions or comments? Amelia, then Barbara. Yeah, just saying that um, I thought it was a great uh, presentation. I know you mentioned the Norfolk situation, but there has been more economic growth along that path. And I like the idea that you're going to do the multi-modal you know, study at the same time. Because a lot of the elderly and others who cannot get want to know that. So that would uh, be something to show them all in one packet. Barbara? Uh -huh. On, I guess it was 539, when you talked about the uh, <coughs> cost and so forth, and of course it, we know that this doesn't include the shared use path, which I think is a, a really critical element. Uh, <clears throat> we've talked about that from the very beginning, and I think it really has to happen in order to make this truly multimodal. When does that cost get factored in? Uh, I, I know it says that the, the cost estimate that you had talked about doesn't include that. So is that a totally separate project? I know it's all city. I, I think it's all city. Uh, I know it's not HRT, but maybe there's federal dollars somewhere along the line for bikes because they usually uh, do have some funding for that. So w when does that get to be in the we, package? You, you know, we've talked the we've talked to the state, Mrs. Henley, about sharing in that, in that cost 50-50, and uh, I think... Ultimately, you'd probably bid that as an alternate to your to your design, so you could see what it costs and whether or not it can be included in the 310 cap that the state has laid out. So I think you would know that after you actually get the bid prices back, which will be a year and a half from now. Any other questions or comments? I'd just say it's a uh, very good presentation. It's time to keep it moving. Yes, sir. Sure you, thank you. I appreciate your time, Council. Right thank you. Okay. Uh, we're going to go to City Council comments. Uh, and before we do that, I, I, I guess I'll be the first City Council comment. I, I, sounds good. Uh, I had the pleasure of running into someone in higher education uh, right after the State of the Business, excuse me, State of the City speech. And was informed how important this broad brand, broad band, uh, was to our city and to our region. Once I heard that, I'm I'm an old guy, and I knew that Ben Davenport was uh, quite active in it. And I reached out to Ben, and Ben has reached out to his staff members, and I'm going to 
turn it over to Ben now with uh, some information. I think you all going to find it's quite important to our city and region and be a good investment for us. Thank you very much. And uh, many of you all know that during the council retreats, we made the biomedical initiative uh, one of our top seven priorities. Um, since that time, we have learned that to become a destination for groundbreaking research, development in healthcare, biotechnical research, pharmaceutical development, and healthcare delivery systems, we are going to need state of the art infrastructure systems, including ultra high speed internet. Uh, I think that uh, it is a credit to the city staff for having been so proactive over the last eight years um, in procuring this forward-thinking infrastructure. Uh, particularly, I'd like to commend uh, Dave Hansen um, and the city CIO, Matt Arve. Um, and after discussions with them and city staff, it has come to my attention that the city of Virginia Beach and the Virginia Beach City Public Schools have been making wise investments in our respective fiber networks. The City of Virginia Beach has close to a $22 million fiber network, and the city schools have a $20 million uh, network. And combined with our next generation network infill, we have a total of $46 million of fiber optic infrastructure in the ground already. But it's not integrated, and it's not being maximized. What I'm recommending is that we explore the potential of the creation of a Virginia Beach or a Southside Regional Broadband Authority in order to leverage the next generation network investments made by our city and the Virginia Beach City Public Schools. And if you all would indulge me, I'd like to have uh, the city CIO, uh, Matt Arve, uh, elaborate a little bit more, followed by Warren Harris. Yeah, thank you. We're glad you're here. Good afternoon. As you may be aware, uh, cities nationwide are, are taking a look at their broadband services. And it's not just because it's a luxury, it's because it's become a necessity in today's uh, technology-rich and ever-changing world. As Council is aware, our master technology uh, plan contains an essential initiative called the Next Generation Network. This initiative is the modernization of an aged infrastructure that no longer adequately serves off-campus city facilities. <clears throat> this initiative will enable the high-quality transmission of data, video, and voice services. I'd like to thank City Council for funding, already funding this initiative in the FY15 budget. To provide you a quick update, we are currently finishing up the contracting phase and within, we will be implement, within implementation services, we anticipate beginning that in the next couple months. As a reminder, this initiative will connect numerous city facilities located throughout the city. These locations include police precincts, fire stations, the Department of Human Services, recreation centers, and libraries. As Councilman Davenport mentioned earlier, the city and the schools have made a significant investment in fiber optic infrastructure. And although today we are not fully integrated, I do believe we have an opportunity to further leverage these investments to support the growing demand for data and information, as well as possibly identifying new opportunities to provide greater bandwidth in support of the City Council's economic <laughs> development initiatives. This infrastructure may also create an opportunity to explore unique partnerships. Since becoming your CIO, I continue to meet regularly with the CIOs of our neighboring cities as well as Tidewater Community College. I have shared with them the vision, the city's vision for the Next Generation Network and the support we have received from you, the city council and our city manager. Although their investment strategies are still not clearly defined, they do see the value in the investments that we are making here in the city of Virginia Beach. I do want to mention that the Master Technology Plan did not include the initiative to create an authority in accordance with the Code of Virginia Wireless Services Authorities Act. Councilman Davenport's resolution would provide us the opportunity to begin the exploration of what it might take to create and operate such an entity. Now my, now my department currently does not have the expertise to create such an entity as described in the Virginia Code, but we will need assistance from many city departments. I also believe that it will be necessary for us to conduct a study similar to what other entities did as part of their planning and implementation processes. Such a study will thoroughly assess the opportunities and risks that may be associated with such an entity. Doing some early environmental scanning, we have, we have located several authorities that exist in the state of Virginia. As a matter of fact, we are aware of two that have a presence right here in Hampton Roads. One is called the Eastern Shore of Virginia Broadband Authority, which has a point of presence in Virginia Beach up at Pleasure House Road. 
and another one is called the Mid-Atlantic Broadband Communities Corporation, which has a point of presence in Chesapeake over at Bowers Hill. Although we haven't had enough time to explore these entities fully, I did want to make you aware of their existence. And I'd like to wrap up my piece of the uh, information by thanking City Council again for investing in our master technology plan as well as making our next generation network one of your top priorities. This commitment will certainly support your economic initiatives. And to talk a little bit about that, we have Warren Harris here. Warren, we're glad you came down on short notice. Thank you, Mayor, members of Council, and uh, Councilman uh, Davenport. Thank you all for allowing us to uh, make some brief comments about this initiative. Um, and, and it is um, ironic, if not uh, fortuitous, that a bit of the vision that you all have pulled together that has culminated in our Envision 2040, where we talk about the connectivity of our community and, and lessening and, and addressing and reducing the, the digital divide that exists, that this opportunity with broadband connectivity and broadband technology has come to the forefront. As we, as you all know, immersed ourselves in that bioscience uh, healthcare initiative, you know, the obvious was there, the potential of what happens and can occur above the ground. But we really didn't talk about it, what really didn't come to, to the forefront until we got heavily involved in that is what has to happen as a part of the infrastructure to support that initiative. And quite frankly, this whole discussion about an opportunity to enhance our, our assets that we've already started with to, uh, to bring that to the forefront to assist us in this initiative will, vitally be, will, will certainly be vital and critical. Matter of fact, when you discuss and have uh, conversations with uh, NIH, National Institutes of, of Health, you know, you're not going to receive grant funding or support from them without this kind of technology. So, you know, from an economic development standpoint, it's quite clear to us how important this is. It's obviously a, an opportunity to address our educational workforce development needs. Uh, it's, it's an obvious opportunity for us to continue to move forward this strategy for biosciences. It's important for uh, the connecting our intergovernmental, educational, public safety, and emergency services response capabilities. So there are broad opportunities that come out of this, uh, not only to grow our entrepreneurial activities in terms of enhancing small businesses and, and overall job creation, but quite frankly, as we want to continue to grow, quote unquote, our knowledge-based businesses, and also protect and retain tech-savvy workforce, you know, this is the kind of infrastructure we're going to need to support our 21st century economy. So from an economic development standpoint, uh, we certainly want to continue to explore this opportunity and see a, a major enhancement to our economic development program. Um, thank you very much. Uh, ben has just passed out his proposed resolution. Mr. Jones and I were talking about it. it it's pretty simple to read. He was going to suggest bring it back in a couple of weeks, but I don't know any of if anyone would object to putting it on today because it's a generality. I don't object. I'm just trying to understand, will we be providing a competitive or alternative source of Internet access in competition with the private sector? That's what I'm trying to understand. If, if I could. Sure. Um, all this resolution does is let us explore the possibility of starting a broadband authority, which has been done by several other cities in the United States. Right. I'm just asking, but under that concept, when they were materialized, are they providing Internet services to private concerns? That's, that's part of what we will be exploring. <coughs> just so you know, I'm in favor of looking. I'm not in favor of us entering the competition with people who risk their own capital and, take their, and pay their own taxes. I'm happy to look but I'm not in favor of competing with the private sector. Well, I don't know about the rest of you at the table, but quite frankly, I don't know a thing about this, but it sounds good to me. Lewis, <laughs> 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 it'll work with your beeper. Uh, All right. we'll, 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 we'll do this as an add-on. Thank going. you. <laughs> Thank you. That's fine. I picked up that. <laughs> we'll do that as an Okay, any other city council comments? Bobby. Yeah, thank you. I'd like to give a major shout out to uh, Sentara Princess Anne Hospital. Uh, my wife and I had the opportunity to spend most of the evening there yesterday at the emergency room. And <laughs> let me tell you that I was so impressed that every point of contact that we had, this place was jammed and busy. There was a four hour wait. And everybody along the line, from the police officer there to the registration people to the nurses to the doctors to everybody, couldn't have been more friendly and accommodating. And 
you know, just to say what a asset it is to this city to office. have that facility there. And let me tell you, I've been in healthcare going on four decades now. You know, for people under stress like that, you know, just to be, you know, pleasant and everything, I just felt obligated to give them a major shout out and, you know, good on them and good on us for, you know, moving forward with that. And quite importantly, my grandchild was one of my grandchildren were born there. Yep. Very good hospital. Yeah. <laughs> yes, Rosemary. Thank you. Thank you. I hope your wife's doing better. Earlier, the tree uh, it came up a little bit that Tony Nero and I are co chairing this fundraising event called Cycle for Survival that's raising money for rare cancer research. Um, ben and Shannon have been involved as well. And I wanted to pass this out. This is how people can get involved and create a team, and it's easy as one, two, three. Tells you exactly how you could do it. And there's a good video you have out that I saw too. It's a really great, yes. And there's, there's, you can take it to the website, and there's a lot of really good information. But the 100% uh, of the money raised will go to, to rare cancer research. And last year alone, one and a half million people were diagnosed in this country, newly diagnosed with cancer. And over half of those, over three quarters of a million people, have a rare cancer. And so this will go to help them. So. Love to see all of y'all out there. It's going to be a very fun and exciting event for something really serious. I think Mr. Mayor would be a wonderful team captain. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Mayor's going to support it. <laughs> to say what date it is. That's right here. No, no. To oh, say it out. It's May 3rd. It's going to be at One Life Fitness, the new one on the boulevard, um, 1 to 5 o'clock. And we've got a we lot of We don't have to pedal for four hours, do we? <laughs> no, no, that's why you have a team. I'm that's why you, you have I'm a team. Sorry. And those of you that want to wear your political shirts, like vote for Ben Davenport shirts, <laughs> you can, we're going to have T-shirts for everybody to participate, but you can wear your political shirts. Then we can get a high-speed Internet shirt made. I like yeah. the sounds of that. <laughs> this is going to be a high-energy event. Yes. <coughs> we're, we're really excited about it. So. Thank you very much. Any other comments? Yes, John. We had a deferred compensation board meeting uh, yesterday. Thank you all for letting me serve on that board. I love numbers. This is a numbers board. <laughs> but uh, the asset value of our deferred compensation uh, is about $281 million. We have about, uh, I'd say about 5,500 city employees who participate. That's 19,000 across all the different accounts. Um, the sheriff's department, so the good sheriff is here. It looks like we have about somewhere in the range of around 500 people participating at the sheriff's department. And because, you know, the school system had an annuity program before we got the, the 503, looks like they have around somewhere in the same vicinity in the school board account. But things are going well. The city employees do a great job. Dan Edwards is the other rep on that board. How much of the assets grow? The equity is a lot of different funds. The equity account was up 12.5, 12.65. Fixed income was uh, 5.97. There's a lot of others. Uh, the bulk of the money is in fixed. Like 43% of all the funds are in the fixed return, which is 5.97, which shows you people are very conservative. So I have to go back and get a blended thing. I'm sure it's in here. I just can't but recall. But those my numbers head. seem to be. But good. that just uh, it. So that's one item. The other item I mentioned last week that I wanted to come back and revisit was the sea level rise. I'm sure most of you probably saw this uh, thing memo that came about two weeks ago from the city manager talking about our responses to Moody's on sea level rise. And the reason why, I know we talk a lot about Vibe District and light rail, but the most pressing threat to all our infrastructure isn't the lack of roads, isn't the lack of health care, it's the impact Independent of what causes it, they'll give you all your own devices. But the fact is, the water table, it, the water level, sea level is rising and creates a serious material threat. Um, and I think that we are not being as aggressive enough in our, in our CIP, even if it's in the out years, identifying what that is. So we take on all these obligations, you know, that we talk about for structured parking and for light rail. And then someone comes back and says to do the Lynn Haven River when the study gets done, you need the coffer dam, and that's $400 million. And, you know, so I think we, we need to pay more attention to what is the demand on our credit line within our bond rating. We already know what they told us about 
two of the rating agencies were willing to think about lowering our bond rating for what we had programmed to do. And so I think we have got to really take this liability into account because it is within the 10-year window that we're going to have to be making some serious capital investments, and we're just discounting that potential liability when our <coughs> revenues are growing at 1.5 percent per year. That's why I think this is important. We are not spending enough time understanding the significance and the capital lean this will have on our taxpayers. And we need to make sure we can afford everything. I think this is one of the first bills we need to make sure we can pay. Great for Barbara. Uh, on the sea level rise issue, ODU is is uh, doing the major uh, work this year uh, regarding sea level rise, uh, and I'm I'm assuming the city is having some participation with that, um, so that we we are able to um, be a part of that work and study, and then be able to incorporate what we need to know and so forth because. You know, we certainly have been talking about the sea level rise issue, but I think, as we've been saying, there's a lot of impact to businesses. They're already seeing things like <coughs> insurance rates that make a great di difference. So what is our participation with the ODU? Uh, well, we're engaged. They're, they actually have several things going on. The whole of government approach study that they're coordinating, uh, we're involved in that. Uh, there's uh, several other uh, professors that are working on that. We're, we started up and... Uh, at our suggestion, a committee at the Planning District Commission to look at it, at it from a regional perspective. So um, there must be five or six efforts going on right now, and we're involved in all of them. And also, Barbara, for the Campsville Princess Anne, that's one of the things they have raised that because of the sea level rise. So that's why some of the delay. So we are taking some proactive steps. Very good. Any other comments? Hearing them, we'll one, now one, have one last one. Certainly. This is one I know I've asked. We had asked we were going to have these uh, people look and assessing the true end to end real net economic impact of these SGAs that are in operation, doing a real analysis, beyond accounting. And there was some discussion we were going to go look at our local universities, business schools, and you took that on. When is that, that going to happen? It's been over a year now that. We've chatted about that. Where is that on the timeline? A lot of the base work has been done. We can give you a detailed briefing on that with, with in conjunction with the light rail because how the SGA is going to develop is going to depend on whether or not we're going to have light rail. So we've been kind of focusing on that at work right now. Okay. Well, if you would just make the body of hard copy literature work available, I'm very capable of reading it myself, I guess, and interacting with the universities. But that's been way too long, in my opinion. Thank you. Any other comments? We'll move on now to the uh, agenda there, uh, Mr. Vice Mayor. All right, sir. Uh, first, uh, we have a couple of add-ons. Uh, the first one is uh, the Peace Monument resolution that everybody just signed. Uh, we put that on as a resolution. And then the second one would be Ben's resolution on uh, the... Uh, broadband internet. Anybody object to those going on? All right. Uh, the items uh, for, uh, well, any on the other items, uh, ordinances and resolutions, is uh, anybody have any comments? Vice or, Mayor? Yeah. Oh. Mr. Wood? Yeah, I, I have a comment on two of them. Um, the first one on item I1B, daily reports on palm brokers, junk and secondhand dealers, precious metal, that sort of thing. I've, I've heard from a couple of jewelers who are upset with, with the way that we currently um, manage this program. They, they're telling me there's different and unfair treatment in their opinion of traditional jewelers as opposed to palm brokers. They have to pay a higher fee and, and that sort of thing. And um, there, there's some problems with reporting requirements. They have to report that they haven't done anything on days they're closed, but they have to turn in a report anyway. So it, it's, it's just a lot of things, and, and they, they haven't really been able to, to to really get a lot of their grievances addressed. I would like to see if, 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 if it's okay, if there's not any pressing reason to, to hear this, to maybe have staff come back. And, and we don't necessarily need to... Uh, uh, 
something done here in the um, as as a presentation, but at least just a write up on this, explaining how it works and 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 what the reaction is from from the pawnbrokers and, and the jewelers. Uh, I, I gather that, that most Sorry. of the most of the, yeah, if, if we could, if, if, I don't know if there's. So are you saying pull it, vote on it, or defer it? No, I, I, I don't think we can defer it if it's not a critical thing that has to pass now. Mr. Sport, does it have to be passed now? No, sir. We can get you whatever you need. I haven't had one inquiry from any jeweler or pawnbroker, so if you defer them to, to me, I, I've, I've sent them to Kathleen. She's she's got them. So. Okay. How long do you want to defer it? I mean, if we, I'll, however long it takes to, to get to get it back. So maybe maybe thirty days. Also, can we go back to the uh, leases and note that I'll be staying on that Chick's Boardwalk Cafe? Okay. Right. And I'm, I'm still, whenever you have got a comment on one other one here. Fair enough. Mr. Mr. Vice Mayor, I'm abstaining on that You're one You're abstaining well. also. Just, just on I, uh, yeah. letter I. All right. All right. Uh, anything else on uh, Ordinances and resolutions. Yeah. Um, Mr. Vice Mayor, also okay. on item I-7, I, I just I, I would like to take the opportunity to thank the City Mayor and Police Department and the Virginia Police Foundation uh, for helping to make this happen to honor the fallen officers. It's a, it's a nice tribute that really doesn't cost us anything and, and gives us the opportunity to to honor honor these folks who've given the ultimate sacrifice. Great idea. Very good idea. John? Um, Mr. Mayor, two uh, two comments. So One on item two on item, I guess it would be looking for the wish stuff right. Three. I would hope that be, even though I don't want to change in the wording that if we can't get an agreement, that before we go to condemnation, the staff would come back in executive session and tell us just so we would be informed of why the non condemnation ideas were exhausted, just so we could be informed as to so we wouldn't be surprised. Because condemning people's property, but I would just like to be advised. What they usually do is yeah. they handle it that way, don't you, Jim? I'll make sure that that's what have play. And I'll be voting no on item 10, and I will have uh, my explanation to this, or at least I'm just at the conclusion of the consent vote. Okay. All right. Anybody else on ordinances resolutions? <coughs> All right. Uh, planning. Ma'am, ma I, I apologize, um, Mr. Vice Mayor, but uh, I believe that item. Uh, one, or I'm sorry, I-2A, did you discuss that that would be to be deferred? No, 2B. 2B. No, 1B. 1B, one, one, one one B. B is deferred no, no. 30 days. No, two A. I, item 2A, the MOCA, the MOCA lease needs to be deferred. I'm sorry. All right, does anybody object to it being deferred? All right. All right. Also, there is a change on 3L and the wording on line 30. It's just a modification, a small modification at that, that Chick's Beach Boardwalk Cafe. Uh, it's a misnomer. It's a technical amendment to correct right. the name of the LLC. So we'll move right. to planning then. All right. Under planning, item J1. Uh, anybody object to that? All right. Two, Crown Castle, USA, Ms. Henley. I think it's finally ready to move forward, but I suspect there are probably some speakers. No speakers? No, no, no. Well, <laughs> I'll be very surprised, but uh, if, it's, if there are no speakers, it can go on consent, but I would like to make some comments sure. just to let you all know what all has been done. It's been enormous the last year. Sure. All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Come on. Okay. All right. Item three: United States management, City of Virginia Beach. We, on we do. Yes, sir. I'm Item four: Chesapeake Bay Distillery LLC Hotline Enterprises, Beach District. Mr. Ern. I'm good with that one. That's a good vibe district yeah. development. You got me down for a state organization. Yes. We have one speaker, but there's I don't drink, well. so. <laughs> All right, item five, Virginia Beach Development Authority, modification of proffers. 
uh, General Booth Boulevard, Corporate Land and Parkway, Princess Anne, Miss Henley. Oh, that can be on consent. <clears throat> Six, Pembroke Square Associates, LLC, Bayside, fine with me. Seven, five oh seven three, Virginia Beach Boulevard, LLC, Bayside. Looks okay to me. Eight, take five, oil change, LLC, Alaskan Road, LLC. Planning staff, staff's uh, recommendation is denial, planning commission's approval. Mr. Hearn. Mr. Vice I'm, I'm supportive of the approval of that. Uh, but I would request uh, that the council consider changing under the conditions that uh, they had originally put at the Planning Commission that it would be uh, 10 years from the date of the approval and change that to 20 and also to strike uh, number 14 that said that they weren't allowed to keep the uh, overhead bays open. But if, with those changes, I would be supportive of that. I, I, I cannot support it. Uh, those two items were put in by the Planning Commission to try to bring it a little bit in compliance with the SGA plan, uh, but I think even with, and, and the applicant said they couldn't comply with those things, but that's such a critical parcel uh, in relation to the Hilltop SGA plans. I just think, you know, we've got these SGA plans, we spent hundreds of thousands of dollars, we spent all these years in planning, and, you know, if we aren't going to abide by these plans, you know, we've wasted a lot of time and a lot of money, and this is certainly critical. And when you look at the SGA plan and the design challenges and so forth, um, I, I totally agree with the staff. Uh, this one well, this doesn't fit. I, I would argue on the other end of that is that really the SGA plan is based on uh, the road project that is yet to be funded by the state. And so, of course, to hold up an applicant and not allow for uh, an actual market-driven use for that uh, is, is not something I'll be able to support, but I mean, we can vote on that. We just discussed this outside, maybe. I think it's really critical. Okay, we'll pull it. John? Uh, you know, I, I, I agree. John, I think his assessment is correct. I, I think we I understand Barbara's concerns. I know we don't want to do too far away because we have another issue with an SGA not too far in the distant future with the road. So I understand, look at it. But I think in the end, one of the things that's the underlying fault of that analysis, that story we just got, Fantasy Island, is that in reality, market will determine what happens, not just planners looking at SGA and writing documents and doing good plans unless you're doing Disney World and charging big ticket prices to come see it. But otherwise, the real world dictates what happens and I think you have to look for reasonable accommodation, and I think this is reasonable. Otherwise, we should be, you know, taking the property off his hands, which I don't want to do. And so, uh, so I, I, but I understand your point, Robert. And I, but I, I think we're on the on the right course. The market has to tell us what will work. Well, then we just leave it to the market and forget the plans. Pitch them all in the garbage. I've said that many times. <laughs> Bobby, yeah, and I, you know, I support uh, John's, you know, um, recommendation. You know, primarily, first of all, this is a good organization. It's going to be a very nice facility. And I just think it's unfair that if you have a vehicle repair place to have a thing on when they can keep their doors open and not and everything, it uh, just seems to me a, a, an unfair condition. And, uh, you know, I will support Josh. Well, That's all they're going to get done is raising and shutting those doors with the five-minute oil change. Well, I think the key, though, is the time limit. Well... I, if they, everyone's okay with it, though, Barbara, I'm going to go ahead and just keep it on consent. If you want to make a comment, well, you can. Okay. All right. But I, I, I might want to go back and change my um, my vote on this thing for the arena because you know if we don't have some guarantee for or some kind of confidence, how in the world are investors going to invest in properties based on a plan, and then they have complied, but then the people next to them we don't stay with the plan you know if we don't really mean something with these SGA plans well first yeah, of all I'd, 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 I'd certainly be saddened to hear that you change your vote for the well, arena I, I said, that, let but, me, I'll but, have to think about it I really, but, I really feel like we have to be we have to know something about what our our, our, uh, our here, actions are going to result in here, here, and obviously I was intimately involved in the hilltop plan but so here's the difference on that 
The Hilltop plan is based on what it is that we currently have in the queue for a road project that we don't have any control over, including the elimination of the, most notably the elimination of those feeder roads, which is a state project, which the state is currently doing something that really doesn't even comport to our, our strategic plan. So to have an individual property owner have to sit out until the state decides what, if they're going to build anything, that's going to be compatible with our plan, I don't think is fair. And, and for the, to ask somebody to do these types of investments and changes in there and tell them that they've got to have that payback in 10 years is just not something I can support. And, and I'm, in fairness to what John is saying, too, I think a 20-year is a short – these plans are more than 20 years. And that road is a huge part of it, but, you know, I personally wouldn't go – Except a 20 year term if it was May. But they have, and they move on. Okay, we'll keep it on consumer. Okay, All right, item nine BH investors, Robert uh, Lindsay Jr., uh, Lynn Haven District, Mr. Wood. Do we, do we have any speakers on that? Yes, sir. There, there was opposition at the, um, well, I saw some written there, there was written opposition there. Is actually. No, no physical opposition. I've, I've looked at it and, and driven by, and I don't, I don't see an issue with it. And from what I understand, they've spoken with the opponents. So if, if there's no opposition, then I'm okay with it. But okay. item ten, NVR Inc. London oh, Farm. What about Prince B? Sand, Ms. Henley. Is it consent on both nine A and nine B? Nine B is fine. Okay. Too. Okay. Uh, yeah, I missed, uh, skipped over Richard S. and Judy yeah, F. Yeah, it is consent. It is consent. Monarch Properties, Inc., Rose Hall. Uh, I'm, fine with it. I'm fine with that. I've heard nothing. You got me down for standing on that. Please. Okay. There's up standing on 11. Number 10 is on consent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then 12, Alexandria Place, LLC, Centerville District, uh, Mr. Dyer. I'm voting no. Okay. Thanks, folks. Okay. Sure you might have. Okay, thank you. Chair will entertain a motion to recess into a closed session pursuant to the exemptions from open meetings allowed by Section 2.2-3711A, Code of Virginia, as been for the following purposes, public contract discussion of the award of a public contract involving the expenditure of public funds and discussion of the terms of discussion of such contract, where discussion of open session would adversely affect the bargaining position or negotiating strategy of the public body pursuant to Section 2.2-3711A29 Arena. Publicly held property, discussion or consideration of the acquisition of real property for public purpose or the disposition of publicly held property, or discussion in an open meeting would adversely affect the bargaining position or negotiating strategy of the public body pursuant to Section 2.2-3711A3 Beach District. Personnel matters, discussion, consideration of or interviews of prospective candidates for employment, assignment, appointment, promotion, performance, demotion, salaries, disciplining, or resignation of specific public officers, appointees, or employees pursuant to Section 2.2-3711A1 Council, uh, Council, Boards, Commissions, Committees, and Arena first Agencies, and appointees to have a motion. So moved. Second. Second. Go ahead and call the roll, please. Aye. Dyer. Aye. Henley. Yeah. Aye. 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 Mr. Wilson. Aye. Mr. Wilson. Sorry. Mr. Wood. Aye. Mr. Mayor Jones. Aye. Mayor Aye. 